thanks. Um, I'm not sure that I uh, formally consented to being filmed for this, but I guess the fact I'm standing up here uh, with a mic on in front of this is implied consent. So, um, Norma mentioned that uh, the Montgomery decision came out in March last year. It still feels, certainly for us lawyers, it still feels like yesterday uh, that it came out, but um, we're, we're almost at the anniversary of the decision. Um, so what I'm going to do, there's been a little bit of case law. Um, you'll be pleased to hear not, not terribly much. Um, so I'm going to go through. Um, there are two cases um, from England that deal with the question of material risk and breach of duty, um, and another couple which deal with uh, causation. So I'm going to just um, whiz through those fairly quickly um, to see if we can take any clues about how the courts are likely to interpret uh, the Montgomery decision. Uh, so the first one here, Tasman against Bart's Health Authority. Um, cerebral palsy case. Um, the, uh, the, the mother in this case um, argued that the treatment had been negligent um, and that she ought to have been offered a caesarean section at an earlier stage given a poor CTG trace. Uh, now, uh, the trust accepted that the CTG was poor. Um, their position was that fetal blood sampling should have been done. Uh, but, and importantly, if fetal blood sampling had been done, that uh, the fetus would not have been shown at that stage to have been compromised. The claimant's response to that was, well, even if that's so, the fact that fetal blood sampling has been done is a material change in this, in this labour, in this delivery. Uh, delivery. Um, and so uh, caesarean section at that point became one of a range of reasonable options that the patient, the mother, ought to have been um, talked to about and given the option of pursuing. And that uh, became the, the core of the consent case. Now, the decision um, here, and I'm going to just, this is a, a quote from the judge's uh, determination, a risk of 1 to 1,000, which is what the court had determined after hearing evidence, was the risk of serious neurological damage in circumstances where fetal blood, blood, blood sampling had been done, but been shown um, or shown no risk. Um, is an immaterial risk for the purposes of paragraph 87 of Montgomery. The Supreme Court eschewed characterising of risk in percentage terms, but it was doing so in the context of defining the borderline between materiality and immateriality. Here, I'm quite satisfied that the risk was so low that it was below the borderline. I'm not to be understood as saying exactly where the thresholds should be defined, so he ducked that particular question. Um, but nevertheless, um, a, I, I think that was, a, a, was taken by uh, trusts in England and by medical professionals as a relatively reassuring sign that notwithstanding what Mon the, the Supreme Court had said in Montgomery that um, it was no longer about percentages, it was about what was important to this particular patient in front of you, nevertheless, uh, the remoteness of a risk is still going to be a relevant factor. <clears throat> and the next case, uh, the second case on, on breach of duty is um, actually a very similar case um, in terms of the rationale of the decision. So uh, the claimant is, is pregnant. Um, her particular background features means that she had a slightly higher risk of um, having a fetus with um, fetal abnormalities than the back background population. Um, and her position was if she had been warned about those risks, she would have had a termination. Um, her position in the court proceedings was that the risk to her of there being fetal abnormalities was between 1% and 3%. Now, as you see there, the court actually held that the, the risk was much lower than that. It was, again, 1, one in 1,000, which I guess is 0.1%. Um, and this judge different judge, different court, um, came essentially to the same view as the previous judge that um, in the Tasman case. Montgomery is not authority. I mean, he's, he started by saying that, that um, by making the point that uh, patient autonomy um, 
was crucially important following the Montgomery decision, but nevertheless, it wasn't authority for the proposition that medical practitioners need to warn about risks which are theoretical and not material. He did go on to say um, that a risk approaching 1 in 100, 1%, um, was likely to have been material here. Um, now, 1% is still probably a risk that um, in some cases is lower than used to be um, the sort of threshold for warning patients about. But I think courts will still probably take into account a distinction between cases where you are dealing with a, um, a, a very low risk of a catastrophic injury and a slightly higher risk of a, a less serious injury. Um, so those, those are um, the two cases uh, since Montgomery which have dealt with the question of um, was the duty of care breached? Um, I think Norma um, talked about causation. It's not enough for claimants to show that um, a duty of care was breached, that a, a particular risk wasn't warned about. You, they've got to go on and cross another hurdle, which is they've got to demonstrate that this breach of duty would have made a difference. And I think, M Mike, you obviously uh, mentioned that as well. So the, the next two cases are about causation um, in, in light of the Montgomery decision. First one, Middleton. Um, this was a, a, another shoulder dystocia case. Um, the, the claimant's third child, born with, with um, a brachial plexus injury um, following shoulder dystocia. Um, this was the, the mother's third delivery. What she didn't know, because she hadn't been told, was that during her second delivery there had been mild shoulder dystocia, which she had been sufficiently mild that she hadn't been actually aware of. Um, and the trust accepted that she ought to have been aware of that. She ought to have been told after the second delivery. So breach of duty was, was effectively conceded in that case. Um, but the issue for the, the judge was causation. Would it have made a difference? Um, because the claimant still had to demonstrate um, that she would have done something different if warned about this risk. Um, the, the trust barrister in that case argued that um, her evidence that she would have opted for a caesarean section was um, obviously heavily influenced by her knowledge of how events had in fact transpired. And that's always going to be um, an issue in any of these cases. Um, claimants are going to um, naturally think that they would have done something different. But that, the fact that they think that doesn't mean that courts are simply going to accept that. Um, the, the trust in that case, uh, or the, the barrister, led evidence from the consultant um, to the effect that he was able to persuade most of his patients to take a caesarean sec uh, sorry, to, to proceed with uh, vaginal delivery in circumstances like this. So if, if most patients would have proceeded, the trust's argument was, well, this patient also would have uh, proceeded. Now, in fact, this wasn't a, a good outcome for the trust in this case. Um, the claimant's first child had been born following a very long and difficult um, uh, traumatic birth. I think the word agricultural had been used um, in evidence. Um, and so the court uh, took account of the fact that that would have um, played heavily on the mind of this particular woman. Um, and so they were prepared in this case to say, well, notwithstanding that the generality of patients would have accepted the consultant's advice and recommendation to go ahead, that this woman, on balance of probabilities, would not. She would have opted for a caesarean section. So that was a case where the, the claimant was successful. But here's another um, with a different outcome. Th this is a claimant with an eye problem. Um, he was being treated medically, um, but at, at some point during the deterioration of this eye, um, there was evidence that he could and should have been offered at least the option of uh, surgical treatment for the eye. Now, the, the surgeon who was treating the patient didn't think that surgery was indicated, didn't think it was a, a safe option, didn't think it was uh, the right way to go, and so didn't discuss it. Um, and that was seen to be, in the context of this litigation, exactly what the Supreme Court had been attacking that as a paternalistic approach to medicine. The doctor knows best. <clears throat> the doctor did know best in this case, but nevertheless, that, uh, that's not uh, what the court is interested in. 
So the, the, again, the, the trust in that case had to accept that a discussion should have taken place at some point about the possibility of surgery. And of course, the claimant's position um, in, at the start of the court proceedings was, if I had been given the option for surgery, I would have taken that option. But importantly, in this case, um, the claimant did accept, when being cross-examined, that he would have followed, or at least he might have followed, um, the advice that the surgeon had given them. And that was an important concession. Um, the, the court also looked at the whole evidence, and the whole evidence included the fact that the surgery carried quite significant risks of its own. Uh, and so uh, the, the court took the view that actually this, this patient would not have opted for, <coughs> for surgery. So I think what we, can, um, what we can draw from, from those cases is that um, things have not all been going in, the, in, the, in favour of the claimants since the Montgomery decision. You'll notice that all of these uh, judgments have been um, English judgments. I haven't mentioned Scotland. Um, that's because there have been no substantive de uh, decisions from Scottish courts um, since Montgomery. Um, Susan, who's one of our colleagues who's sitting at the back there, has um, recently run two cerebral palsy cases for the board, for this board, um, and won them both. And in the context of, of one of those cases, um, after uh, the evidence had been heard, but before the judgment came out, the claimant, I think recognising that things hadn't gone terribly well at proof, uh, tried to amend their case to bring in a Montgomery-style consent case. Um, so the, 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 the judge had to determine whether to allow that. Now, that's essentially a procedural decision, um, and it's fairly fact-specific. He didn't allow uh, the case to be amended, and the judgment when it came out was in favour of the board. Um, what he did say, though, he made a couple of comments that were quite helpful and I think, again, give a slight flavour of the way that uh, judges are, are looking at this. Um, one of the things that claimants, counsel and solicitors have said ever since Montgomery came out is we don't need experts to give evidence in court in consent cases anymore. It's a matter for the court to judge if there's a material risk. Um, so doctors' views on all of this are irrelevant. Now, we've obviously always taken the view that that was nonsense. And in this particular case, Lord Stewart agreed. He said that the question of um, whether a risk is material must involve some kind of discussion about what the risk was. And only um, medical professionals can give evidence about that. So, so they will continue to have a role to play. Um, so that was, some, that was helpful. But he also said something else which I, I think is um, helpful. He said... Um, experts would be required because the question about who in the clinical hierarchy is responsible for disclosing is something I think the court can only learn from professionals. And I think that probably um, is evidence of a fairly nuanced um, understanding about the consent process. This is not something that is about um, the um, discussion that takes place every single time a health professional sees a patient. There is a process um, at play here and the consent um, discussion is, is often a process. It's not about a single or serial conversations with health professionals. So I think that, that understanding shows that there is a, um, a sensible approach to how consent is done. So, just drawing to a, cl a close, what, what can we take from, from this? There's not, not much to go on yet, um, but I think there are some signs that um, courts won't allow cases to succeed where there's a truly remote uh, or rare risk. I think, um, despite what the judges said in Montgomery, that um, percentages are still important, and I think that is a helpful indication. Um, and, uh, of course, Courts claimants rather will still have to prove that they would have done something different. There has been one decision where um, a claimant effectively suggested that there should be a, a, a freestanding right to damages where uh, she wasn't uh, properly consented and the courts have rejected that approach. But as I say, there still aren't many decisions, so I'm not sure that we can draw um, a huge amount from, from what we've uh, heard about.
And I think, importantly, none of these decisions on breach of duty um, address the kind of thorny issue which um, every, every health professional that we've spoken to has raised, which is, what about the particular patient in front of you? Um, what about the patient who's the um, violin player? <clears throat> None of the cases have dealt with that um, issue yet. I suppose what I would say about that is that um, one of the cases that you mentioned, Mike, um, a, in your uh, lead up to Montgomery, the Rogers case, the, the case about the eye, um, that was a case that was actually used by, as an example by the Supreme Court in Montgomery um, I, as an example of the patient with specific characteristics. Um, so that was a patient who had already lost an eye, who was being um, given treatment for the other eye and the Supreme Court made the point that um, the discussion needed to take account of that particular characteristic. Um, they also mentioned that that particular patient, I think it was a Mrs Rogers, um, had uh, repeatedly asked questions and expressed anxieties about uh, the loss of her sight. And it seems to me if that's the example that's being used by the Supreme Court um, of a patient who has particular characteristics. Um, that's still the sort of situation which I, I guess is, is part of your everyday discussion. Um, I don't think uh, courts will expect you to take a life history to find some quirky feature of, of a patient in front of you. Um, the, the test which Norma um, set out is about the reasonable patient. Um, it's also it, it, the the terminology is in, in relation to the particular characteristics of the patient in front of you is that those are risks or features which a, a doctor does or reasonably should know. So um, you're not expected to know everything about the patient in front of you. If you don't actually know some particular feature, uh, the question is would a reasonable doctor know that? So there, there, there clearly needs to be a dialogue. Um, uh, there, there will be a discussion, but you're not expected to go uh, to the ends of the earth to, to identify some um, unusual feature about the patient in front of you. Um, <clears throat> that last quote is a professor of uh, law at Edinburgh University who um, I, I wrote an article about Montgomery, which was actually very sympathetic to health professionals, um, and, and that was her closing comment, which doesn't help in judging which information to disclose and which to withhold medical professionals must make comprehensive efforts to ascertain the patient's perspective on what they want of their treatment and of course to document what they've, they've done or that they have done so. Um, and that of course I, I suppose um, demonstrates the anxiety which Montgomery has arisen, um, the, the use of the word comprehensive, um, how realistic is that in the context of uh, the environment that you actually work in. Um, and I think we don't yet know the answer, but I think that there are some signs that courts will adopt a fairly realistic approach to the pressures that uh, you are under, um, and that perhaps the, um, the more kind of extreme version of what Montgomery could mean for the medical profession may not transpire to be the reality as further decisions are handed down. And I think that the, the final um, thought that I would leave you with is that uh, I asked our finance team to, to look at the number of anaesthetics claims that the CLO has uh, dealt with over the past few years. And um, in terms of sort of pure, uh, perhaps you shouldn't use the word pure, but the, the, the type of um, anaesthetic claims that involve um, injection of anaesthesia, um, it's a very small percentage of claims, of all our clinical claims that come from uh, the anaesthetics field. Um, it's possibly as low as 0.5%. <clears throat> and that's reflected in my personal experience because in the, the eight years or so that I've been at the CLO, I've dealt with two anaesthetics claims. So although some of you here will have been involved perhaps peripherally or as experts in, in these cases, and although your figures might, uh, which I presume were UK figures, suggested relatively big numbers. In fact, this is an area of medicine which doesn't give rise to um, a huge volume of claims. Some, sometimes the claims can be catastrophic uh, in terms of outcome, but they don't give rise to, to huge volumes. So that um, is, is worth holding on to as well when uh, thinking about the potential anxieties that Montgomery um, perhaps uh, elicits. So thank you.